what I'm excited about, and I'm just going to whack the old VMS on here. There we go. What I'm excited about here is that at Lake Caroline, yep. the Hay River track is quite defined down through there. But if it floods, you can't do it. Now, the TOs down here have told us that we can run a new track just off to the eastern side, follow yes. a tributary down. I like the sound of this already. Gets down to the Madigan line and we'll be the first to ever do it. Hasn't been done before. It'll be a proper track after this. 100% proper track. Unreal. If we can do it. Unreal. That'll get us down to the Madigan line. We're starting here at Batten Hill Camp, yep. which is, in my opinion, an absolute cracking place. It's a great place to start really. a trip like this. If you ever get a chance, come down to Batten Hill, folks. But for now, for us... We're going to finish here down at Pope Hill Corner. Yeah, we are. That's, that's, that's the a thing mile then, away. Well, it's a long way away, then QAA across. Yep. So. Hay River track, it's one of the most iconic tracks in Australia, folks. Honestly, if you get a chance, put it on your bucket list. For us, we're not going to settle with just doing one of the hardest tracks in the Simpson Desert. We're going to make it harder. We're going to punch a new line from Lake Caroline all the way down to the Madigan line. Oh, mate, I'm super excited. I've never done the Hay River, let alone this new track. Punch a new no track through. Done, so, mate, count me in. All right, well, I'm going to sit down, have another brew. Yeah, right. The boys are cooking us dinner. We'll kick off tomorrow morning. 100%. Well, see you. Batten Hill Camp is our starting point and Popo Corner is our end goal. And to get there, we're going to head down south, down the Hay River track, but stopping off at Lake Caroline. From there, we're going off the track to push our own alternate track that will run parallel to the Hay River for some time. And eventually, we'll rejoin the Hay River track, head right into the Simpson Desert to Popo's Corner, where Northern Territory, Queensland and South Australia meet. If you're into tough four-wheel driving and epic campsites, then this is the video for you. And I've also got cracking news too. Get 10% off store-wide at Four Wheel Drive Supercenter. That's 10% off winches, spotlights, and heaps more gear. Just keep an eye out for the exclusive discount code in this video. And of course, enjoy the adventure. This northern part of the Simpson Desert is absolutely stunning. And the landscape resembles a Wild West movie with its rugged red rocky outcrops and vast plains that stretch for as far as the eye can see. To travel through here is a real privilege, but you need to get a permit from the Central Land Council before you start your trip. This is wild and remote country out here, so do your homework and figure out what supplies and fuel you're going to need for the size of your vehicle and group. Generally, it's about 7 litres of water per person per day. We've done a lot of preparation to get to this point, so we're ready to head south and hit the Hay River track. Sean, sure, no. there's a sign here on my right hand side mate, it says Hay River Track, what do you reckon? I reckon mate, go for it. Never done this one before so I'm pretty pumped to give it a go. It really is recommended that you don't take on this trip alone. And joining us on this trip, of course we've got Brad McCarthy and Ben from Max Tracks. Now these guys are driving one insane Chop 200 series 6x6 vehicle. And up next of course, we've got Stu Dog from Wholesale Automatics. Now he had a 4,500 5, km journey just to get here. And of course he took every single back road in Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland just to meet us here at Bratton Hill. Up next it's Andrew Bourne in his 79 series ute. He absolutely loves remote area touring and this will be his first time across the Simpson Desert. And last in our convoy with a very important job of carrying a lot of our supplies of fuel and water is Russell Stewart from Continental Tyres. I just absolutely love remote area touring. It doesn't come more remote than the Hay River track. I've always wanted to travel down here and um, to start this track, I'm pretty excited. And um, another thing you'll notice about this trip, in fact, is we have our um, chuck vehicle down the back. It's a 79 series, bog standard, and the only modification we've done is actually change the tyres on it. So I've got Russell from Continental Tyres out with us at the moment testing these tyres, see exactly how they go out in one of the harshest terrains known to four-wheel drivers in the Simpson Desert. So. He's um, carrying a lot of our water and a lot of our fuel and um, also testing a bit of tyres. What a job. You might have noticed the old D-Max looking a bit different the last time you saw it. Well, the reason is the boys at Linex in Silverwater in Sydney, they pinched it off me. They said they were sick and tired of seeing it getting dented and scratched because of the way that I drive it so darn hard. And I thought, well, I can't argue with that. It's true. So they've gone and put their protective spray coating all over the entire truck. So. The main body of the truck has got their ultra coating on it and then they've put their XS350 or their big sandpapering gnarly finish. Now the reason I'm actually at the front of this trip is because we are hoping to jump off the track at one point and put a new bit through. And it could get quite scratchy through there so as the lead vehicle I couldn't care less. Now it's late April and the ground is as dry as a bone so the progress is fairly straightforward but it's not always like this. 
just thinking to myself as I was cruising along here, it's been about eight years since I last did the Hay River track, but it simply couldn't have been more different to how it is now. Cast your mind back to around about that 2010 mark, it's when the Simpson and all this area out here got a massive amount of rain and it just coincided with when I wanted to do the Hay River track. Of course I had Shorty back then and I've never encountered that much mud in my life, my entire life. It was truly one of the most epic trips I've ever done. It's great to be able to come back and see it how it normally is. So I'm really looking forward to doing the Hay River track as it's meant to be done, not flooded. <laughs> Sean, you got a copy? Yeah, sure do, mate. Got a bit of a milestone up here, mate. Yeah, what's that? Have a look at your VMS. Ah, there we go, we're still on the track. The old Tropic of Capricorn. You want to jump out and get a photo? Yeah, I wouldn't mind, actually, mate. It's, uh, that's cool. Ah, look, it's the same old sign. What a ripper. The old Tropic of Capricorn, mate, though, for us, really only marks the start of this track. It does. We've got a long, long way to go. So, um, I don't know, grab yourself a quick photo. I'll take it if you like. Yeah. And then we'll I'll... move on. I wouldn't mind, mate. Done. Look at that. It's, it's been worn out. This must be an old sign. Out here, you soon realise the scale of things. Huge distances between waypoints and places of interest. And it's easy to drift off looking out into the distance. But you can't get too complacent driving around here because you really need to look out for washouts and branches that could stake your tyres or damage your vehicle. Now, out here, you've got a lot of mulga wood and iron bark. This stuff really is as tough as metal and it will cut through the sidewall of your tyre like a hot knife through butter. And what, this is the start of um, the track we're going to try and forge? Yeah mate, so she's a bit of a detour. Um, the idea I believe is that uh, during wet seasons out here when this part of the track is really, really bad, this will provide a bit of a higher run through. Yeah right, that makes sense. It's hard to imagine this place underwater but it does happen. I've seen it first hand mate, it's, um, it's a sight to behold. That's right, we've almost made it to Lake Caroline. And it's here that we can start to forge the new track. Lads, I reckon we zip in and have a quick look at Lake Caroline. What does everyone, what does everyone say? Sounds like a good idea, mate. I'd um, love to get out there. That gets us 10 k's closer to that rocket. Yeah, that's true. I'm picturing a nice blue lake, a um, couple of camp chairs set up beside it. Unreal. Yeah, I think it'll be very similar to that, mate. Pina coladas. A few coconut trees, um, not too many though. Well, what do you know? There's certainly no bikini babes splashing around in the water, no deck chairs, coconut trees, or even a little bar with cold beers. Hey boys, I've got two things to uh, proclaim. The first of which, uh, what do you reckon about this is a campsite? Pretty pretty bloody good if you ask me, somewhere out here. Yeah, it's good mate, I reckon uh, I could see ourselves pitching camp and having a fire, having a cook up. Well that brings me to point number two, my good friend. Ain't no wood out here. Someone's gonna have to go back to the river and get some wood. Yeah, you're right, mate. Unless you want to burn some spin effects, there's not much out here. We're still gonna hug the edge of the lake just in case it's still boggy in the middle. And that's a great tip for anybody who comes out to the outback and sees a dry lake. Don't just drive out onto it. Take a walk and look at the middle because usually you'll find a really thin layer of dry clay that's hiding a lot of boggy mud underneath. You drive into that and your vehicle will get so stuck you might even lose it. That's the thing about the outback, never believe a lake has water in it, a river has water in it. I reckon this is us, right out here in the middle of the lake, what a cracker. But the good thing about dried up lakes and salt pans out here, they make for a very comfortable drive on the edges because it's so smooth and flat. And it also makes a great place to camp on as well. Alright, a couple of things that I have a love-hate relationship with when it comes to the desert. Number one, fly bales. I hate them, but the amount of flies out here at the moment is unbelievable. And I just you can't operate without them. You can see everyone's wearing them. We've all got our fly veils on and they're next level. So if you do come out, bring yourself one of these, they don't cost much. Now, the bit that I love, have a look at this campsite. Perfectly flat ground. It's not going to rain tonight. Conditions are sublime. A little bit of cloud cover, that'll blow over. So tonight, I'm going back to absolute bare bones setup. Nothing more. The swag on the ground. Well, it's that time of day. It's time to roll out the swags and set up camp. Graham, myself, and Russell will be sleeping in swags tonight. While Brad, Andrew, and Stu, they've got fancy rooftop tents. Either way, it's going to be absolutely superb camping. And what a cracking evening it's turning out to be here at Lake Caroline. The one thing you'll definitely notice out here is the huge skies. And Graham, well, he's onto it with his camera. 
Have a look at that, will you? Look, a question I get asked all the time is, I'm going around Australia, I'm going out four-wheel driving a lot more, what sort of camera should I buy in order to capture all the memories out there and make great photos? Well, I'm gonna run you through my three choices really quickly. First and foremost, and it definitely is first, your phone, folks. Look, phones have come of age. They're amazing, so easy to use. They do everything and they also take ridiculously good photos. If you're getting into photography, you're just a beginner and you just wanna capture things like that scene out there, campsite, your phone is your number one go-to. I use my phone all the time. Now, I'll just put that away. If I'm not using my phone, I use my little mirrorless camera. These things are the bee's knees. They're fantastic for people that have got into photography and want to take things a bit further. You can change the lens, you can put different lenses on there, and when you pack them away, they're so light and small, you can literally throw a body, a couple of lenses and a flash in a backpack, and away you go. Then, if you want to take it next level, I've actually borrowed this off our stills photographer, Dino. Of course, this is a full frame professional camera. Pros and cons of each. Okay, the phone, as you know, the photo quality isn't fantastic, but the pros are straight to the internet, straight to Instagram, straight to Facebook. You can message it to friends, you can send it in an email. So quick and easy. These little things, as far as I'm concerned, there are no negatives. This is one of the best cameras you can buy. Really lightweight, fantastic quality. You can upload it to your phone straight away. There are no negatives. This, best photo quality you'll get, big and heavy and expensive and you still need to know how to take photos. When it comes to photography, it's not the camera, it's the person using it. But I tell you what, if you wanted my one recommendation, get yourself a little mirrorless camera, get out here and use it. Now you might have seen the 79 at the back of the convoy here. Now this one here, of course, is the one Russell's driving. It's got a lot of our supplies on it. You see, it's pretty important that we have enough fuel to do this trip. It's about 650 k's, but it's not, of course, highway driving. It's some pretty hard terrain, a lot of soft sand. So we need a lot more fuel than we'd usually use on the road. So we've allocated about 200 litres per bigger vehicle, like the 79 and stuff like that, that chew a bit more fuel. The D-Max has got about 150 litres allocated for it, and I reckon it'll come back with, with about 100 litres of that as well, because it doesn't use much fuel at all. With water, we've gone about, I think it's about sort of five litres per person per day, but we've actually got a lot more than that, because we've, we've got to take into consideration cooking and washing hands and stuff like that. I've actually got a shower on mine, so I've got about 100 litres on my 79, just in mine alone. So, a bit of uh, trip preparation, I suppose you'd say. Simpson Desert is no doubt a great place to come, but you've really got to be prepared. Take enough fuel and water, but a little bit extra, you'll have the time of your life. Once the sun has dropped and the fire is going, it's time to sit back and relax with a beer. But not for too long, because I'm cooking tonight. Look out boys, I hope you got strong stomachs. How good is this? The Simpson Desert, no doubt one of my favourite places on earth and I reckon the best part about it is the camping. As soon as it, the sun goes over those dunes, everything goes a little bit red and I reckon it's just one of the best places you can camp. Pitch of swag anyway. So tonight I want to cook a bit of a special meal. It's an old favourite of mine. In fact, I've never cooked it before but I'm going to grab some chicken out because tonight it's chicken boschiola. Now, what you'll notice, one of the really cool things about coming to the desert, it makes you think a bit outside of the square. Now, what I've got here, it looks like a bunch of mess in a couple of bags but now here I've got some chicken I've actually cry back before I left home I actually cry back a bunch of things because we're out here for a couple of weeks I reckon thigh feel is probably one of the better cuts of chicken you can get someone chuck, say thighs chuck a little bit of oil in here mate how you doing bud chicken thighs look at this so what do we got here what do we got here we got pasta pasta yeah so I've got I've got your one on yep I've got, 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 got a little bit of water show me timbers yep it's starting to get warm at least yep, so it's good what, what else I want, what I want to do is cook the chicken first whoa whoa yeah, no, she's hot. She's, That's real hot. Yeah, I've got to put more chicken in, mate. So what's the plan here? You just cut that up? Just, all you want to do is basically brown the chicken off. Well, as you can see, there's a, there's a fair bit of juice form from those thighs. So you want to get all that chicken, chuck it over there. Yep. Keep the juice in the pot because that's uh, that's what we're looking for here. And then I'm going to put the onion, the garlic, the other bits and pieces that make the old boschiola. Chuck, chuck that straight in. Boom. All right, do we need some oil, dude? Let's put a bit of oil in. Last thing, last thing, last thing. The smell of juicy thighs. Bit of garlic, bit of garlic. Think that's a lot it. of garlic, mate. Go hard, man. I like garlic like the best of them. That's half, that's half a jar. So half a jar of garlic. They're the old mushrooms. Last thing. Pigs. I actually took no chances. I went to my local supermarket and got the old bacon already diced. Oh, so, what? So it just comes. I, I actually froze you, it. You, sir, are a lyrical gangster. <laughs> that I, is. I froze it yep. and kept it all nice. That is perfect. Look at that sizzling away in there. Straight in, straight in. Nice. Oh, get, that, get that really hot. What I'm going to do right on. now while you do that, yep. we'll take him straight off and I'll put the fettuccine into that. Oh. Yeah, that's hot. Settle down. 
Add bacon, garlic. Yeah, and mushrooms and onions. Onions, holy heck, you can have anything with that. That's looking good, mate. That's not nice and brown now. You got the, the bacon infused yeah. with the garlic with the onions, the mushrooms. Mm. Now it's time to chuck a bit of cream in. Always a little bit hard on yeah. the top. It's yeah. always a bit hard on the top. Do you need two? Yes. Chuck all that right. other one in. You basically just want to get that all mixed in. That's ooh, look at that. Yep. What's next, man? All right, chicken. Yeah, Introdu introduce the thighs to the cream. Exactly right, mate. Yep. This is the bit that magic is. There's a lot of juice Whoa. in that still. Oh, that's, that's, but that's tasty. That's, that's, that's good juice, though. All right, just go gentle here. Slowly introduce them. Don't go all at once with the thigh up there. Yeah, I mean, just if you, if you, yeah, don't be silly. Just go gentle. There you go. Right now. And get the last bit. Got a bit of basil here. I've, I've frozen this. This is a little test to see how cryovacking works. All right, I've cut that up now. That's going straight in like that. That is a typical spoonful. Yeah, smells good. It smells really good. All right, put the lid on. Put the lid on. Oh, you want to do that? Yep. Lid Hang straight on. on. Look at this. This old. This thing doesn't owe you a cent. No, friend. mate. I've had. The, honestly, I bought it just around the corner from here in Maduri. No. It's actually coming back home. Ooh, you good heavy. with that? That's a lot of food. Just, you right. watch the pasta if you could. Yeah, I got this. I got this. Wow! Look at the smell on that, mate. Look at the smell on that. That's hard Ooh. to do, but I will. You can look at it. <laughs> smell it. Man! So good. Really? I pasta come out. Dude, I, I, <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm excited. That I'm is, excited. That it's going to be a good meal. This is a pasta of the ages. Do you yeah. want to just go? Have a bit. Because if, if it sticks to the Land Cruiser. Ah! We've got pasta. Yeah, boy! we got pasta. <laughs> Do you mind if I call the boys in? Call the boys right. in. Get them, get them served up. Ready yourself? All right, mate. Get the lads in. That's it. We've got Come on, boys. All right. Get some of that in there. We've got a bit of garlic bread too, guys. There so you jump go. in. Get I chucked that, that on the coals. Move around. Before. Move around. Right. We've got Parmesan there. there. You go. Right, Next. Bro. Look, you don't have to rough it when you come to the Simpson Desert. Do a bit of prep when you before you leave. And um, you two can be enjoying a Boschiola. I reckon. What do you reckon, fellas? 12? Nine. 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 That's Nine. A, I'll take that. I'll take that. Let's go down Nine. to the fire. I'm going to grab another bit of I'm garlic bread. Dip for that. Get down to the fire and get our lips around this. Unreal. Get more for less at Four Wheel Drive Supercenter with incredible deals on Adventure King's camping and outdoor gear. Take your camping experience to the next level with the amazing Grand Tour Mark III aluminium rooftop tent. The rooftop tent that practically sets itself up. King's portable gazebos are built ultra strong with a tough steel frame, are easy to set up even by yourself and are available in multiple sizes for the campsite or the job site. The incredible new 270 degree freestanding awning can be set up in just 40 seconds and wraps around the side and the back of your car for incredible amounts of shelter. Hit the water on a King's inflatable stand up paddleboard for an insane amount of fun at the beach, the river or the dam. But warning, it's highly addictive. Plus there's fridges, solar panels and more to make every adventure incredible. At Full Drive Supercenter you get more for less. It's day two of our trip and we're here at the very dry Lake Caroline, preparing ourselves for another day behind the wheel. A strong southerly wind came in camp last night and it made temperatures drop down to below seven degrees. Over on our right hand side here, we've just got the tail end of Lake Caroline, which if you can imagine after a flood would be absolutely massive body of water which then feeds into the Hay River and this is a really wide point of the Hay River you'd almost mm, call it a floodplain of sorts so when it does flood out through this way and you do get a bit of water through here it almost cuts off this section of the Hay River track not a very big section but it almost cuts it off and that means the Hay River track can't be used as an all-weather track the idea of us finding or making an alternative only just a couple of kilometers over is that that is a higher piece of ground doesn't flood as much thus if this area is flooded and we can get in on this side, on my left hand side, it could mean that the Hay River track will be an all weather track. That's the idea behind this. Let's see how we go when we start turning left off here and pushing through the bush. But, win or lose, make it or not, this is exactly what I live for. All right, we picked up an old fuel drum put on the back of the 79 here. The reason for this is, I'm gonna take it off the 79, sit it here, Put a couple of stickers on it and that'll um i guess mark the start of this track mate that is a very fitting track marker exactly right mate. Oil drum. start of the track and therefore somehow anyhow declare this track is open hurrah <laughs> hurrah to the land cruiser that's really fine let's go all right so this is it 
where we're going to spear off and create a new route for the traditional owners. They've given us permission and have warned us it could be very slow going due to the terrain out here. Tell you what mate, as soon as you start to forge a new track I get super excited just going where no other four wheel drive's been before. I reckon it's going to be it's going to be pretty heavy going too. I don't really know what to expect mate, I'm just going to, yeah, but I love doing it. This is my bread and butter, I love doing this sort of thing so, yeah, follow me. <laughs> this is so cool. Heading off the Hay River track and starting to forge our own track. Alright, just looking on the VMS here and in front of me, tributary of the river. Vague vehicle tracks, very, very vague, but I think, yeah, you can see between the dunes, I reckon this is as good a spot as any to head in. This sort of spin effects country can be really hard going. It looks seemingly flat in the surface, but under all that spin effects, there's lots of potholes and ruts that can really catch you out. Yeah, the spin effects doesn't help. I'm trying to avoid those clumps where possible. Um, she's pretty open in spots. How you doing back there, uh, Brad, in the 60? You'd be all right, wouldn't you? What bumps? Oh, you suck. I'm not even talking to you. Stew dog. Yeah, no, mate, I'm all good. It's nice and smooth back here. Andrew, give me some hope. Just like a bitumen road back here. Thanks for flattening it out. Ah, oh, goodness gracious. I'm not even going to ask you, Russell. The other thing you really have to be concerned of out here is driving through this sort of Mulgawood country. Bits of Mulgawood and iron bark can literally be as hard as steel. What you got up in front, mate? Is it a sand dune up in front? Yeah, mate, a little sand dune. I'll try and find a way over that, eh? That should be good, mate. That'll be uh, a bit of a challenge, I'd reckon. Yeah, 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 yeah. It'll be. We'll, um, we'll have a crack at it, see how we go. Okay, it's time to tackle a dune, and Graham's into it. It really is a challenge out here to be the first vehicle in the convoy. Not that I'd tell Graham that. You've got to really try and use enough momentum to get up and over the dune, but at the same time, you don't know what's up in front, so you don't want to cause any damage. No dramas, boys. Come on up. Now it's Brad's turn in the big 6x6. Six six. Now, as you can see, this is a true six-wheel drive vehicle. And look at that. It made it over with ease. Now, up next, it's me in the big 79. Listen to that thing go. Whoops, <laughs> it looks like I haven't quite given it enough momentum to get up the hill. That's kind of embarrassing. The first sand dune of the Simpson Desert, and old bug lugs over here doesn't quite make it. Yeah, Sean has been that guy again. <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement, Stu. I think is that they've taken the top off it now, mate. Now yeah, it's all just sand. All right, a little bit more mumbo. Look at that. Easy does it. <laughs> We're back in the game. Now old Stu Dog's not hanging around. He's seen me not give it enough momentum, and he's not going to make the same mistake. Into it, mate. That 79 series of Andrews is a real beast. It's running the same Steinbau module that I am, and it's got loads of power. You should make this easily. <laughs> You've done the same as me, mate. Uh, might have to have another go. That's all right. Have another go, bud. See, if you blokes had autos, you just drive up it. All right. Andrew's second attempt and he's not hanging around. Get into it, mate. That sand is starting to get super soft with a few vehicles going over it. That one worked. All right, Russell, your first air dune in the Simpson Desert, mate. Good luck. Oh, nice drive, mate. Just the right amount of momentum. And the good news is you've only got another 1,100 dunes in front of you. How much fun is this? Man, the man this cruise is tough. Uh, another little journey here. I don't think it'll give us any problems, but uh, I'll try and pick the best way through. We don't exactly know what's on the other side of the dune, so especially when you're the first vehicle over the sand dune, it's really important to back off as you get over that tip. And lucky Graham did back off in this instance, because there is quite a steep drop on the other side of this dune. And here comes the big 6x6. Look how easy it climbs over that dune. Nice work, Brad. All right, it's my turn in the big 79. Now I've picked the right gear and I've got a little bit more momentum than last time. I don't want to be the laughing stock of the whole convoy again. Wasn't too bad. Stu's not hanging around either. <laughs> Nothing but sky. Good drive, mate. Just the right amount of momentum. Bit of a little lip off the top there, isn't it? And Russell's going the bog stock 79. He's really giving those AT3 tyres a workout. Let's go Ooh, just not enough momentum in this instance. Back it up and have another go. That's a good thing about the desert. You don't always have to make it up the first time. The last thing you want to do is cause damage to your vehicle. Alright. You've made it look easy that time around, mate. Well done. This sand dune is deceptively steep. Oh, so close, mate. That was a weak effort. 
Now Graham's got the line sorted, he's backed up to give it another go. Yeah, it's really bumpy, like you can't really hit it too hard. Never stopped me before. And this time, he can use more momentum. But <laughs> he's not hanging around this time. Go, Graham. But if the D-Max can't do it, Sean, I reckon you're gonna struggle, mate. Oh, big time, mate. Nearly airborne at the top, he makes that drive look super easy. A lot of red dust, mate. It was a lot softer than I thought, but uh, I think I've taken the top off it. I reckon you'll be fine. Put Brad in the big 6x6. Six six. It doesn't look like he's got quite enough momentum. Oh, that's a lot of sand, eh? <laughs> Back you go, mate. Very soft. On his second attempt, I see a little bit of wet sand around one of his rear tyres. It's worth getting out to have a look at anything that looks a little bit different, especially when you're so remote, like in the Simpson Desert. I just noticed in my vehicle that a lot of wet sand around this tyre makes me think there was moisture, so I wanted to have a quick look at it. I think just a bit of water's come out of the water tank and wet it, but you always want to be super visual on these sort of things. Anything that looks a bit wrong usually is. In this case, no dramas whatsoever, just a bit of wet sand. And it looks like it's just coming from the overflow of the water tank. So all is good. That time Brad's made it look easy. All right, I'm up next in the 79 series and I'm not hanging around, I'm straight into it. Third gear, low range, and a lot of right foot. And look at Stu Dog, he's absolutely loving this sort of driving. There's no hanging around for him. Andrew's up next and have a listen to that vehicle. The big four inch pipe on the back of that 79 makes it sound so good. And Russell's up next. And it really goes to show that with a basic stock vehicle, with just a set of tyres on, you can really take it to most places in Australia. Man, there's spin effects out here, I tell you what. It's just such an awkward shape, and it's like driving a boat in sloppy seas, I suppose. You can't drive fast, and it's just really lumpy and quite uncomfortable. It's not the first time I've had to do it. So when I'm forging a track like I am right now, I kind of try and avoid the spin effects clumps as much as possible. Spin effects country at the end of the day, but <laughs> it's quite a, quite a bizarre sensation. Slow and steady wins the race. I got a little bank here, guys. I don't know how I'm going to go getting up this, but I'll, um, I'll have a tackle at it and hopefully it's nice and soft and I can get up and over it. I don't know. This sandy little step up is an awkward little challenge. Yeah, a bit steeper than I thought. That's a go. Graham has managed to claw his front end up, but he's got hung up at the rear. <laughs> You're thinking you're stuck, man. I think someone made some sort of, I don't know, orange coloured board that had traction on it. Yep, I'm not going anywhere. Come and get me. We could drive, mate. We could drive. <laughs> now, you're probably wondering what those little metal spikes are on Brad's set of Max Tracks. Well, you see, he's developing a new prototype and he's out here in the desert testing them with us. We give it a go. That's better. Leave them there. I'm not going to give the game away just yet. But as you can see for yourself, they work incredibly well. And would you look at that, piece of cake. We decided to leave the Max Tracks in place because they're actually forming a nice little ramp. As you saw, that was pretty easy. Put the Max Tracks under the vehicle. I think the key for that one was to dig out a bit of that sand. And as soon as the vehicle got up onto those Max Tracks, the chassis was off the bank and he got out pretty easy. So we're actually going to leave them here and um, that should give him enough traction to get over. Once one vehicle goes over, I reckon this will be like a highway. You see, when you get the first, second, and even third vehicles up, it'll knock the top off this lip and make it a lot easier for the rest of the vehicles in the convoy. Little bumpy little start here. I'm not 100% sure where I'm going here either. Up ahead, Graham's struggling to find the momentum he needs. Oh. So close. Mm. Driving sand dunes in the Simpson Desert can really be a catch-22. You see, on one hand you want lots of momentum, so you can make it up the soft sand. But on the other, you can usually find that there's lots of lumps and bumps at the start of these sand dunes. If you hit them too hard, you actually could cause yes. breakages in your vehicle. Nice drive, mate. That was uh, <laughs> that's pretty soft at the top by the looks of it. Now for Brad in the six-wheeler. Go now. Look at it go. What a way. But he too is struggling to find the right amount of momentum. You just need a couple more wheels, Brad. You gotta keep in mind the weight of that big 6x6 is probably over five tonnes. Whoa. Okay, now he's not holding back. Have a go of that. 
Now Stu's seen how it's done and he's not holding back either. Go on. I don't know what that was, Stu, but have another go, mate. That's a lot better, mate, and you made it look easy too. Glory or death. That's the combination of good driving, low tyre pressures, and heaps of grunt. And glory it is. I think Russell's biggest problem was he didn't have wheels on the ground long enough to get enough traction. No, nah, he's not going to get over this without breaking something. So it's out with the max tracks and see if we can claw him up nice and easily. Go, 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 go. And look how easy that works. Yeah. Man, it doesn't stop. Look at his next one. Like waves in an ocean. Damn. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sean, eh? You got a copy, mate? Yeah, mate. Can you see where I am sitting on top of this journey? Yeah, it's a funny spot to park. All right, I gotta come clean, mate. I was thinking about the Birdsville pub. I was thinking about a cold beer, um, and I've just cooped it, mate. I'm bogged. I can see that. I can see that, mate. Um, look, I'll come up there and um, hopefully I don't get bogged too, and uh, we might chuck some max tracks under that thing. It's probably the easiest way to get me out of here. I can go forward, I think. Let's just do that, and let's not talk about it again. Whoa, I've dug a hole. All right, <laughs> he's got himself. Just right on top of a dune. Sometimes the dunes will be a little bit steep. You park right on top of them. Doesn't matter how capable the vehicle is in the sand, it will just go down. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you just wouldn't come to the Simpson Desert without a set of max tracks on your vehicle. Well, as you can see, I've I've gone all the way to China here. You've done well. Yeah. You've done well. I think the key when you do get bogged like this is just to spin those tyres. That's what I did, mate. Get yeah. it right down. That's what I did. Yeah, I just thought. <laughs> No, because I was creeping forward, you see, and I thought, well, maybe, 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 and then there was a part there where I had to admit it wasn't going to happen. Good luck, mate. Right now, it's in the middle of the day and the sand's at its hottest. This means that it's also at its softest as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you got a copy back there, Shawnee? Yeah, I got you, mate. Mate. It's getting that time of day. What do you reckon we try and get over this dune and see if we can find something out of this spin effects country? Yeah, mate, I, I, this is a big dune in front of us, too. Whoa, Struth! Something tells me I ain't gonna get over this dune in one try. I'm looking forward to this, actually. Jeez, that's intimidating. All right, I'm gonna take me both hands on the wheel. Bye. Come on. Oh, yeah. Come on, old girl. That's a big dune. Go, old girl. Uh, he's made it look easy, too. Look at him. It's actually, it's, it is boggy, but it's not too bad. And there's actually, it looks like there's some nice campsites on the other side. Whoa. I'll let Brad get up first, and then, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea, because then you'll have something to winch off. Ah, oh, this is good country, isn't it? How much fun was that, mate? The big semi nine just cruised straight up that dune. Didn't look like it stop me, mate. Listen, a quick question, Andrew. How about the Steinbauer fitted to your semi nine now since practically day one? What, what sort of difference do you reckon it would make? Yeah, mate. There's a reason uh, this is one of the first mods we did to this car. It uh, gives us plenty of punch to get up those dunes. And uh, in this car, we picked up about 25% on top of the, um, the standard car. And that's the thing I love about it the most, mate. Is the safe tuning behind the Steinbauer modules. I know that. Even out here in the desert, I've got my foot flat to the boards and I know that nothing um, bad's going to happen to the engine. I'm not going to cook it and um, worse, be stranded out here. Steinbauer's work really well to give you safe power. They uh, change injection duration, doesn't change pressure at all. And the nice thing is that they trim back under extreme pulling conditions. It's very slow, but it keeps those EGTs in check. And more so, mate, it's um, a plug and play unit, so it's very easy to install. Yeah, absolutely, mate. You can uh, unplug it and go back to the standard vehicle really easily. If you're trying to diagnose a problem or a fault, you can just go back to standard just by unplugging it. Well, mate, I can uh, speak from experience and say ever since I had that Steinbauer fitted to my 79, it's absolutely changed 
this 79 is an absolute animal and it's um, not just good out here in the dunes but also back at home when I'm towing the boat and, um, and just really putting a lot of load on the engine. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't be without it, mate. And um, it's a good thing I put it on this trip because some of the sand up ahead is uh, super soft. Let's get into it. But I can see a bit of high ground over here that looks reasonably flat. I'm just gonna poke my nose in here and have a look and uh, this could be camp for the night. Well, it looks like we've all conquered our last sand dune for the day. And as that sun starts to get low in the sky, it's time to find a good place to camp. And this place, well, it looks as good as any. Nice and flat and nestled in between two sand dunes. Oh, Struth, thank you, Mr. Linex. Welcome to paradise, boys. Oh, how good's that, mate? This is pretty spectacular. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't get any better than camping in the Simpson Desert. And especially this time of day, when the sun's just starting to set and everything goes that really deep red. You've got the fire going, burning a few pieces of mulga wood, a couple of cold beers in your hand and having a laugh with mates. Well, it simply doesn't get any better. Get more for less at Four Wheel Drive Supercenter with insane deals on King's DIY storage and 12 volt gear to build your dream four wheel drive. Whether it's an inverter you need to run 240 volt gear on the job site or the campsite, a battery box or a 12 volt control box to easily access your power, King's 12 volt DIY gear is what you need to take your 12 volt setup to the next level. Need a battery? King's has you covered with a full range of AGM, slimline and lithium batteries in sizes ranging from 98 amp hour to 200 amp hour. All built with ultra high quality components to go the distance. And of course you just can't beat King's solar panels and blankets to silently charge your batteries anytime the sun's out. At Four Wheel Drive Supercentre you get more for less. Waking up out here in the middle of the Simpson Desert just has to be added to everyone's bucket list if you ask me. The sense of remoteness and freedom is absolutely amazing. Mate, early morning in the desert, I don't know, it's just, it's I don't want to get all romantic and stuff, but it's just it's bloody no, magic, isn't it? I'm getting what you're told, that's yeah. for sure. It's, it's just, it, did, you, did you hear anything last night? Nothing at all, mate. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. just, it's always eerily quiet. You yeah. get up really early in the morning around here, there's no birds, it's Nothing. just, Nothing. it's different from where I come from. I just think it's got to be, uh, the Simpson Desert has got to be put, it's not hard, it's not hard. It's got to be on everyone's bucket list. Oh, big time. Just to get out here, big get time. a big fire going. I think what people don't really comprehend is just how remote it is out yep. here. Yep. Like, yep. went for a walk on, yeah, even this sandy that we're standing on right now, probably, the, I don't know, the first people yeah. to stand on it for 100%. a thousand years, yeah. who knows? Easily, easily. It's no. old It's got to be done. Mate, what I think we do today, is continue pushing south and try and push this track through as far as we possibly can. Yep. And then just see how we're going for time, because time's playing on us a bit. And then we might have to push back onto the hay yep. and head on down south from the yeah, hay. That detail will be complete yep. then. Yep, 100%. 100%, 100% this, is, yeah. this is some of the best country you'll drive through too. It's, it's just, so open. Yeah. It's a bit wobbly on the old spin effects. Exactly, it's hardcore but, on the suspension and stuff like that, but. Otherwise, she's pretty easy going. You're getting the swales until you've got to cross a dune. But uh, no, nah, I'm looking forward to another big day out here, mate. What do you reckon? All right, let's get into it. Done. It's time to make a mile. We've still got a load of this track to push through and then reconnect with the Hay River and on towards Popel's Corner. There's a good sized hill for goodness sake. I think the further you go south into the Simpson, the bigger the sand dunes get and that's really evident right now. I'll try and ease my way up this and see how I go. These dunes are not only getting bigger and more frequent, but the vegetation is also a challenge to navigate a path through. Come on old girl. Yes. Oh, no. Just a little lip at the top, and uh, not enough momentum, I think. To be fair, Graham probably has the most challenging drive out of all of us because he's up the front. He's got to find the best route, flatten out the ground, and keep drive cautiously in case of any sudden drop-offs at the top of the ridges. <laughs> Once Graham's done his bit, we can all learn from his drive and either follow suit or give it more momentum. We can also get the word over the UHF if there's any hazards to avoid. Right, another sand dune. This one looks a little bit soft, I reckon, so second gear low range and uh, we just stand on it. <laughs> in my opinion, the number one mod you can make to any vehicle is not so much a mod, but to make sure your vehicle is in great health. The second most important mod I'd have to say would be suspension. A conservative two inch lift 
suited for touring is perfect out here. And that brings me on to my third point. Tyres are extremely important out here. And while it's fine to run one spare out here, I really do recommend two for this sort of remote area touring, especially if you're going to venture off the beaten track. I think you'd have to agree, despite being a bit bumpy, this detour, it's just nice to uh, get off a track, see something a bit different, do something a bit different, cross country, eh? Man, I just can't believe that we're probably the first four-wheel drives to come through here. It's always exciting, you never know what you're going to find. But even we're the first human, mate, not just four-wheel drive. This is true, at least for quite a few hundred years anyway. We've got another one here, boys, up and over, eh? Build the revs, as you can hear. Oh, here we go. Graham's up first and he gives it just the right amount of momentum to get up and over. Good drive, mate. Up next is Brad in the big 6x6. Now he's seen exactly what Graham's done and he should find it no issues whatsoever. One of the things I noticed yesterday, I was struggling a lot when we started hitting that dune country because I've had my tyres running at about 26 psi and that seemed to be pretty good for Hay River Track. But as soon as we started hitting the dunes, it still wasn't enough to get up half of those dunes. So, now I've put the tyre pressures down, and as you can see, I'm just in second gear. Just not, not even giving it that much, and I'm just gliding over that tune like it's nothing. And I've gone down to about 18 psi, so I've taken, you know, what, seven psi out of those tyres, and it's just made driving so much easier. Not to mention, I'm using less fuel now, too. I can feel the Eagle's not working as hard. I'm not having several goes at dunes. Um, as soon as we get back onto that Hay River track, I'm probably going to put them back up to about 25 psi again. There's a sharp left-hand turn at the top of that dune. You can't give it too much momentum or else you're going to go off the track. That's it, Andrew. Plenty of right foot, mate, and it makes easy work of those big dunes. Have a look at how soft the sand's getting. You can see that by the amount of sand being churned up through those tyres. And Russell from the rear of the convoy is doing a great job. Well done, mate. Well, I'm having an absolute blast out here, but like a lot of things in life, time's got the better of us, and we are gonna have to call it on this overland track. It's definitely possible to push this through. It's just that time won't allow it for us. So we're gonna let the Batten Hill boys know, and hopefully they'll follow our wheel tracks, no problem at all by the time you follow those six vehicles. We'll tell them, and hopefully they can finish what we started. For now though, we're gonna hang a right, get straight back down to that Hay River track, and continue south, which is nothing to complain about. Righto lads, it looks like this will be the final June before we get back on the track, eh? I never like to give up on a plan, but Graham's right. We've got a schedule to stick to, oh, and we well don't want to risk running out of supplies, which could easily happen if we run over schedule, and then something goes wrong. Ooh, we got another bit. It's like a double whammy. Here's Brad, will make it look super easy. We're all aware that the clock is ticking, and we need to get a move on and try our hardest not to get bogged. Chuck some sand up that thing. <laughs> Momentum is your friend. Up we go. We're doing it. Each vehicle is eating the last dune before we get back on the hay. Good work, guys. What do we got here? What do we got here? VMS says... We are back on the main highway. I'm just going to check for traffic. I think we're clear. Bit of a shame that we've finished that. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, I was enjoying that. I think we've still got a fair bit of this track to go, and uh, it, I think the end bits are um, quite slow and bumpy, so be careful what you wish for. It's funny though, when you come from that cross country stuff back onto the hay, it feels like a highway. It really does, doesn't it? Feels like a Queensland highway. Hey, you blokes, you want to uh, you want to chuck some diesel in these trucks before we get going too much further? Yeah, better weight redistribution of mine would be great. All right, let's pull up and we'll um, we'll do just that. This right here is Camp 16 on the uh, Madigan line, or the junction of the Madigan line and the Hay River track. The tree here is where old Cecil Madigan, his camels and his party of nine men in 1939 camped for the night. It's the blaze tree that they left behind. We aren't on the Madigan line, of course. We're going to continue straight down the Hay, but the Madigan, one of the, probably the, one of the tougher tracks. It's mine next to do, mate, that's on for sure. On your next to do list yeah, with yeah, uh, yeah. Len and Frank, who've been down. They've been down. They lost 100 litres of water due to the poor bladder design. Terrible. So, if you, I hope unlucky. you guys got through, let unlucky. us know if you didn't. But for us, <laughs> if I don't get out of these flies pretty soon. Yeah, yep. We are, are going to get eaten. Ooh, south? Uh, ooh, uh, keep going south. I'm going to say good day here. Put Shawno from Shawno. In my opinion, it's a good idea to try and get the fuel from your jerry cans into your fuel tank as soon as you can. That keeps your centre of gravity good and makes driving in the desert a lot easier. Just about to fill the vehicles up. Andrew's got a great little tip that I reckon everyone should use. I didn't think about this. I always thought when you get a lot of dust around the top of your, your jerry can, just to try and be careful. That's probably not good enough, is it? No, it isn't. You just, 
look, honestly, you don't want to get any of this stuff in the fuel. So the best way is to get rid of it. What's that solution you got there, this mate? This is just white spirit. So we're going to get rid of all of this residue here. So that there's no chance of getting any of this in there after we, while well, in the process of fueling up. Make sure I get every last drop in there. That'll do me. On a Simpson desert trip, such as this one here, or any desert trip to be frank, you can use up to 50% more fuel. Here's a few reasons why. I'll run you through them. Things like the amount of gear you carry, mods like bigger tyres and bull bars, and the very nature of driving in hot conditions on soft sand means your engine is working harder and using more fuel. While you're never going to get normal fuel economy in conditions like this, there are a few things you can do to help improve it. One, avoid rapid acceleration and harsh braking. The less you work your engine, the better your fuel economy. Number two, every time you stop, do yourself a favour. Turn the engine off and don't leave it idling. And three, don't bring any gear you don't need. The heavier your four-wheel drive, the more fuel you'll use. Now, I've done the maths. The old D-Max here is returning 11.7 litres per 100 kilometres. I'm talking low range, cross country, Simpson Desert. Those figures are staggering. And yeah, the D-Max is known for its really good fuel economy, but by following those three tips, I've made it even better. We've made some great time cruising down the rest of the Hay River and onto the French line. We're making good progress towards Popals. The sand is getting softer and softer in this midday sun. That is soft, boys. Only just made that, mate. Only just made that. Are you boys going back there? We were doing pretty well until suddenly Andrew sinks down. Oh, I'm stuck, boys. <laughs> oh, you're stuck, Andrew? Yeah, mate. Good and proper. That is loose. Yeah, nearly caught me out, mate. Um, what do you reckon? Snatch trap? Yeah, sure. We can snatch it out if you, uh, if you can get back up here. I'm just going to try and reverse, um, reverse up there, Andrew. Good luck with that. I'll do it. You can't quite come forward, eh? No, I can't move it. That's all right. I'll just chuck a strap on there, I reckon. And with any shackle that I put on the vehicle, and keep it on the vehicle, especially when I'm on these corrugated sort of stuff in the outback, I always chuck a cable tie in to hold the pin of the shackle in, because over a lot of different corrugations, this will literally just unthread and you lose your shackle. So I'll just put a little cable tie, and every time I need to get to it, I'll just cut it off, put a new one on. The cable ties are cheap, and I don't want to be caught without a shackle out here. Andrew's right on the ridge, so this should be an easy little tug forward on the snatch. I've also got the benefit of gravity on my side, so I'm going to take it really easy here. Thanks mate. The old humble snatch strap saves a day again. You know, I wouldn't be caught without one of these. Always keep one of these in the vehicle. And I've got to say, it's probably the most versatile bit of recovery equipment you can have. And even if you travel solo, have one of these, because if you do get stuck, you'll be able to get someone else to help get you out. So I always carry this as the first bit of recovery kit that goes into my full wheel drive when I do any trip. Last up, we've got Russell, and he's not holding back. Good work, mate. Oh, yes! It's cruising along the edge of the Salt Lake here. Now, when I was here back in the floods, this was virtually a no-go zone. You could get across, but you couldn't get down the way we're going right now. You had to come a long way around. And I tell you what, it was a different environment. For us, though, it does mark the end of this part of our trip. We're going to head now down to Purple Corner, which is a pretty special spot because it's where South Australia, Northern Territory, and of course Queensland, the borders all meet. So you can sort of spread yourself over it and be in a, a lot of different parts of Australia all at once, and it makes your time zones go all crazy. So I think the boys and I will head down there right now, have a look at it, and that will probably be the end for us. But of course, we can't live here. We've got to keep going. For now though, I'll see what the boys are feeling like. Keen for a photo with Purple Corner? Absolutely mate, that uh, sort of marks an epic trip. From our first trip into Australia and four wheel driving, fantastic boys. It's been a great run down here from uh, Jervois all the way, loved it. Can't wait, sounds a great idea. Hay River track done and just about to come to Popal's Corner where a bunch of states meet, Northern Territory, Queensland and South Australia. What a way to end a top trip. At Popel's Corner, you'll find some parking bays and a boardwalk out to the marker. It's where three states join, 
Queensland, Northern Territory and South Australia. And if you ask me, it feels just a little bit better standing in the Queensland side. Well mate, that was one cracking trip. Hey River Track, she's a long one. Oh, a big one. And I tell you what, it couldn't be any more different to when I did it. No, Floods, mate. wet, it was nasty. Yeah, this is very doable. Mate, I, the first time I've done it, I've always wanted to do the Hay River and yep. I'm not disappointed. I reckon no, that was epic. And to go off the beaten track, yep. holy heck. Yeah, no, it was once in a lifetime sort of spot. I reckon if you're going to come out to the Simpson, it is a really good way to get north. Yeah. Then track around if you want to go to Alice Springs a different way. Yeah, hey, River Track. Absolutely. We've still got to get out of here. I know, and this is the best bit of it. It really is, folks. We'll leave that up to your imagination as to where we're going to go and how we're going to do it. But for now, thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next time on Order of Action. He's got it. He's Maybe got the Burswell Hotel. We'll see Burswell Pub. Oh, yes! Look out! <laughs>If you're after a next level 12 volt upgrade for your vehicle or your next camping trip, then check this out. The Adventure King's 120 amp hour lithium battery. This uses high capacity, brand new grade A lithium iron phosphate cells capable of thousands of cycles. It's paired with a high quality BMS able to output up to 160 amps of current. The future of 12 volt setups is here. Lithium batteries are super lightweight and still have heaps of power capacity. In fact, this battery weighs just over 15 kilos. That's about half as much as a similar capacity AGM. But that's not all. Lithium batteries have the ability to use their entire capacity from 100 to 0% and still have an incredibly long life. The reason Adventure King's lithium batteries are so good is because they use lithium iron phosphate chemistry. That means if you're using the entire 120 amp hours of capacity in this battery every day, it would still last almost five and a half years. Some cheap lithium batteries use grade B or even secondhand cells to keep the cost down, but not here. Adventure King's lithium iron phosphate batteries use brand new grade A prismatic cells. When these batteries are assembled, each individual cell is matched with others and then grouped. Then those cells are balanced, which means that these batteries always function at their best and ensure you have full capacity. Another major feature of these Adventure King's 120 amp hour lithium batteries is the high quality internal battery management system. This BMS for short takes care of the individual cells. It balances them while you're charging your battery. It prevents overcharge, over discharge, over temperature and short circuits. A high quality BMS is so important and it's also incredibly important to match the BMS to the cells and the use of the battery. A good indicator of a high quality BMS is to look for high current discharge and charge ratings. This battery is capable of charging and discharging constantly at up to 100 amps and it can do a peak discharge of 160 amps of current. A high discharge current and a high peak discharge current are very important if you want to run things like inverters that need a lot of power when they turn on to fill the capacitors. If you're looking at a battery that has a much lower charge and discharge rate, they could be cost cutting by using a cheaper BMS. Lithium iron phosphate is a safe technology, unlike some other lithium chemistries, and Adventure King's lithium batteries are doubly safe. Not only are they sealed and safe to use in your vehicle, they've also passed a short circuit test, overcharge test, over temperature test, and a vibration test. So they're ready to be put to use. Some lithium batteries are extremely sensitive to hot and cold temperatures, and they can be damaged or destroyed by trying to use them. Adventure King's batteries though, can be charged anywhere from zero to 50 degrees Celsius, and used or discharged anywhere from negative 20 right through to plus 60 degrees Celsius. They use threaded M8 terminals for high power output and easy connection. Measuring it at 330 millimeters long by 162 millimeters wide and 215 millimeters tall, they fit perfectly in an Adventure King's battery box for a lightweight and powerful portable power station. And with 120 amp hours on tap, you could run a camping fridge for five or even six days. Or you can permanently install them in your vehicle for a next level, super powerful setup that barely weighs anything. And for that reason, they're perfect for your full drive, motorhome, caravan, or camper trailer, where you need to be concerned about GVM and GCM limits. So if you want a safe, 
lightweight, super powerful, and super long-lasting lithium battery for your next level setup, you can't beat an Adventure King's 120 amp hour lithium battery. Introducing the incredible Adventure Kings Premium Camp Oven Stove. Your new best mate for delicious barbecue or campfire cooking and warm, cozy fires whether you're at home in your backyard or at your favorite campsite. Let me show you all the things that I absolutely love about it and I'm sure you're gonna love too. This amazing bit of gear has been designed right here in Australia and it combines a camping stove and a portable barbecue into one. It can run off multiple fuel sources, wood, heat beads, charcoal, briquettes, and more. When it's time to cook up a feast, you can fit two large pots or pans on this huge flat cooktop surface that measures in at 520 millimeters long by 300 millimeters wide. That's enough space to cook up a feast for the entire family. And because it runs on wood or heat beads, you can leave the gas bottle behind. One less thing to pack. And when you want a beautiful roaring campfire, use the included hook tool to simply lift the two-piece lid off completely and just add in some more firewood. The raised and closed design means you won't risk scorching your grass, your deck, or even your driveway. And you'll be able to use it for a beautiful warm fire at campsites that don't allow open ground fires. Plus, your fire would last longer because you're closer to the heat. Now that's cozy. The enclosed design means it's super efficient and you can make the most of your fuel by directing the heat exactly where you want it. You can even adjust the temperature of your fire by varying the airflow. With these sliding vents on the side, a two-piece removable lid on top and an adjustable flue, you're always in control. Remove the entire lid for an open fire or just this circular inner piece if you need extra heat for cooking, like searing steaks to finish them off. And this up here, now that is a real game changer. A chimney that extends over 2.4 meters off the ground to direct smoke away from your campsite for smoke-free campfires. You can even position the premium camp oven stove under your awning, your gazebo, or your shed for maximum warmth. And the angular offset chimney piece allows smoke to funnel away rather than getting trapped underneath. There's even a spark arrestor on top for good measure. There are so many more things to absolutely love about the King's Premium Camp Oven Stove. It's been designed to be super sturdy with these four large legs that extend the footprint a foot wider in both directions for excellent stability. The legs simply screw into the bottom like this and you can remove the middle piece for a lower fire. This huge access door swings open with the included hook tool to allow you to easily refill the Premium Camp Oven Stove as required. Inside, you've got this fuel rack that keeps your wood or your charcoal up off the floor, maximizing airflow and preventing wasted heat. It's a breeze to transport, set up and pack down to with no tools required. Each of the four two-piece legs simply screw together and the chimney pieces pack into each other with everything fitting into the main body of the premium camp oven stove for simple transport. Make sure you don't miss the incredible genuine cooking accessories available too, like a proper wood-fired meat smoker and a clever barbecue hot plate set to really take your camp cooking to the next level. And a stainless steel water boiler too. Whether I'm at home in my backyard or out camping with family, my mates, or even by myself, I absolutely love my Adventure Kings premium camp oven stove. It's a portable fire pit, it's a wood or charcoal barbecue, and it's the centerpiece of every backyard get together or camping adventure, and I know you're gonna love yours too. You asked and we've listened. The incredible MT1 Go Anywhere camper trailer has just received an ATM upgrade to two tonnes. All new Adventure Kings MT1 camper trails will now come with the new upgraded two ton ATM. But don't worry if you already own an MT1 because a retrofit upgrade kit is available too. The MT1 is already an ultra tough trailer with a one piece 150 by 50 mil chassis that extends right from the drawbar all the way to the back of the trailer. Now it's even tougher with upgraded suspension, bearings, brakes and wheels to bring it up to a two ton ATM. The brakes are upgraded from 10 inch to 12 inch electric brakes. The alloy rims are now rated to two ton ATM and an upgraded set of suspension arms also suit the upgraded ATM. And for existing owners, the retrofit upgrade is incredibly easy to do at home yourself. Everything just bolts onto the trailer with no modifications needed. 
That extra payload capacity means that you've got more ability than ever before to carry the gear that you need and still remain legal. For more information and full detailed specs on the MT1, see the four-wheel drive Supercenter website. Now with a two-ton ATM upgrade, the Adventure King's MT1 Go Anywhere camper trailer can carry more gear than ever before.